I graduated from college the very first year that Teach for America was founded. I think at the end of the day, there were sort of three unifying themes. One for me, and you know, just following at the end of the day, my instinct and my gut and my passion. And I think my first job out of college being with Teach for America where it was very much a job of passion. It's been so hard. As hard as I try to settle for anything less than a job, and so I think that has sort of characterized a lot of the choices I've made in my career. I think the second thing is sort of opportunistic, like really just pursuing opportunities where I felt I could best leverage my passion and my relative strengths and where I thought there was a lot of room for impact. Um, so that's, I think, again, having grown up with Teach for America, and I'll talk about that in a minute, the very first year it was founded, and seeing it go from just an idea, literally, and you know, 10, 22-year-olds to what it is today, it's really hard again to settle for anything less, to settle for incremental change. And I think the final part, just luck. I mean, I just felt like the timing had everything to do with it. I think a lot of what we're doing today, um, 10 years ago even, we would not have even begun to imagine. And a lot of it is because of the human capital that's beginning to move into the space. I think the entire landscape's beginning to transform. It's a lot friendlier um, for people who are very goal-oriented. So I just think, I just happened to have graduated from college at a time when this was all just beginning and I got in at the right time. So Matt wanted me, the very quick highlight, I joined um, Teach for America in, <coughs> I should have brought water with <laughs> no, I just ran that. 20, that's right, I'm so dehydrated, dehydrated, I ran the marathon so we get, I thought you were coughing, they no. concealed the <laughs> year dehydrated. you joined. I, 1990, <laughs> so Teach for America was founded in 1990, I was a senior in college, we were actually the very first recruiting school, I had planned to go to law school, I really thought, you know, law school, but I wanted to take a couple years off. Nothing really resonated with me in terms of what to do with that time off. And literally, I think it was a week before winter break, when I'm like the only of one of my friends who has not had my act together, which was pretty atypical of me. I tend to be a planner. You know, when we got flat, we woke up one morning, all of the seniors on campus, and found a flyer under our door advertising Teach for America. And by the end of that day, about five of my friends had stuffed the flyer in my hand and said, you know what, it looks like you found your calling. So I thought it was going to be a two-year commitment, and, and you know, I was going to law school, be a lawyer, and here I am, 18 years later, still in the space, and probably more excited, definitely more excited and more optimistic than I was, um, even as an idealistic 22-year-old. So I taught for three years in Brooklyn, New York. I taught fourth and fifth grade, and I had thought I was relatively well enlightened when it came to social issues. I had spent time working with New Haven children all through college, but when I saw the the circumstances in which my children lived every day and literally the obstacles that came at them and the odds, the huge odds that were against them to just, you know, even make it to high school graduation. It was just, it was a real eye opener and I think by the end of my three years teaching it became evident to me that <coughs> the solutions weren't conceptually that hard to think about. It was a huge willpower issue, a huge focus issue, and a huge execution issue. I think once you see the juxtaposition between the reality of how things are and your ideals and realize that that gap doesn't have to be there, it's really, really tough to walk away. So I then, I did that for three years. I did a fellowship in public policy. Then Wendy Kopp at that point was trying to scale, to build, to really stabilize Teach for America. We actually did the opposite. We had the opposite strategy. We grew and then we had to really consolidate and we had to scale down. And so I came in during what she calls in her book, the dark years. We were literally about to go under. Most people thought we couldn't make it. Um, the angel investor wired in money last minute, literally the day before we had to make payroll. And I came on board to help her build out the national organization. So I spent four years as the national head of program where I ran all the recruitment, selection, training, support of all of our teachers across the country. And by the time I left, I realized, you know what, we desperately need more private sector management know-how in this space. There's so much idealism, so many great ideas, but at the end of the day, again, it boils down to execution. There's so much loss in the execution gap. And so at that point, I tagged on the MBA to my JD, nice. and then I went back to school. I loved it. Um, I realized how little I knew in the private sector, so I ended up deciding I wanted to take a stint learning about business skills. I thought the best training I could get would be for to be at a management consulting firm. Um, I did a summer with them. I took the bar. I joined them after graduation. I was there for <coughs> two months, literally two months, and Wendy Cobb called me again, and she said, you got to come back to Teach for America. So she, at that point, had this huge vision. We had stabilized the national organization, 
and she had this vision of we have just got to get critical mass. We have got to get you know talent in every classroom across the country. We got to get alumni of Teach for America running for office, publishing newspapers, writing letters to the editor, running companies, figuring out where the capital goes in this country, setting policy, providing health care. She just felt, you know, we've got to get alumni who know what it's like to be out in our public schools, who have leadership, who can really help tackle this issue from multiple angles. And so she called me up because she wanted me to take Teach for America in New York um, from 200 core members she's to 1,000 core members. And at that time, just to lend it some perspective, Teach for America, all, the whole country, was 1,000 core members just a couple years prior. And so she said, imagine if we can fill New York City classrooms with all the core members that are right now spread out across the whole country, what an impact we would have. And Joe Klein and Mary Bloomberg had just arrived. And I remember I was at McKinsey in my cubicle, watching, you know, from Boston, watching New York, and this opportunity I've been waiting for my whole life like this remarkable <coughs> leadership at the highest level of city government, announcing these really ambitious reforms for the city. And my knowing right away, you know what, human capital is going to be critical to pulling this off. I just couldn't walk away. So I thought I was done with TFA, but I came back the third time. And that was in 2003. And we thought it would be a five-year growth plan minimum to take us from 200 to 1,000. But at the end of the day, within four years, we had hit it. A lot of it was free riding on the leadership of the mayor and the chancellor and all the other things that were happening across the city. So I wasn't actively looking for the next thing, but I think at that point we were beginning, I felt like we were starting to stabilize in New York, and I said earlier I tend to go for the big quantum leap opportunities. And I have a dream at that point, which I had heard about in high school and really hadn't heard about ever since high school. Um, they were looking for a new person to lead up, and I just, in my gut, I just felt like there's so much upside to this other organization. And what I loved about it, you know, all the reforms that have been done, I think that the exciting stuff, KIPP, the charter schools, Teach for America, Human Capital, new leaders, you know, the principals pipeline, um, Joe Klein, you know, redefining the school district. That for me is all supply side reform. Like I think at the root, when you think about what the framework to understand our, the problem in education, I think we have had a broken supply side, we also have a broken demand side. And you have all these great people working on the supply side, but then they're beginning to run into trouble. As TFA wants to grow, go to new sites, as KIPP wants to have 100 more charter schools, you know, as Joe Klein wants to increase teacher accountability, they're having a really hard time because the, the demand side is not collectively pushing for more. And the demand side in this case being the parents and the students primarily. And I think in the private sector, the customers vote with their money. You know, it's like if we all buy Starbucks, the other coffee people have to compete. But in education, obviously, the taxpayers diversify group and the people who pay the most taxes tend not to be the ones who care about what happens in Fort Greene, Brooklyn. So we don't have a, a sophisticated demand side. And I think there are two huge impacts of that in education. One is the one I talked about, we don't have you know, there's not at a mi macro level enough pressure or political cover for the supply side reforms. On a day-to-day -day individual level, we're leaving a ton of value on the table. Even with our current broken school system, a middle-income parent who's gone to college and knows how to do it and who has political, social capital, you know, knowledge capital, they will figure out <laughs> how to extract 30 to 50 percent more value from our current school system. Our parents simply don't have the, the wherewithal to do it for a lot of reasons. And so I kept thinking, I have a dream, but we, we basically sponsor entire grade levels of children, <coughs> getting, so about an 80 to 100 at a time, getting in first grade, and we promise them college tuition, they graduate from high school, and then we take them up all the, all the way. And so the first thing we're saying to them is, we are saying, you've got to aim higher. You're meant to, to go to college. And that recalibrates their entire, the vision for their future. And that creates the motivation and the incentive and the demand side as a starting point. And then we're really trying to figure out how to close the culture capital gap and the knowledge capital gap um, to help them get there. And I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm rambling, so I'm just gonna wind up with one quick comment. Um, when we get into this panel discussion, I, I will say I came on board about a year <coughs> ago. So we're sort of at the beginning of the growth trajectory. In fact, the first thing I did was say, we're not ready to grow, mm -hmm. stop. <laughs> Because we were growing opportunistic, like stop. You know, it's actually good that we grew up until now because we now have a laboratory of you know chapters doing all different things across the country. But we needed to first get ready to really grow the right way. 
Um, so I'm going to be talking from a limited perspective from, you know, for Ivy Dream in terms of what we've done already here. But Teach for America, like I sort of took that from beginning to end, so I sort of understand the whole process.